Okay, good morning. Um, I want to discuss today the mapping from spins to bosons, discuss the Bose-Hubbard model that describes uh, uh, describes a model with um, uh, kinetic energy of bosons and interactions and shows how the competition between these two terms drives a quantum phase transition. Okay, so let's begin. Here is the Heisenberg model that we talked about last time. Um, this has two pieces, the xy term, which can be written in terms of raising and lowering spin operators and the zz interaction. If we think of the reference state to be the zz term, for antiferromagnetic interactions, this describes a classical nail state with alternating up and down uh, spins on the neighboring sites. The XY term generates fluctuations in these states. Basically what it does is it acts on a pair of spins up and down and flips these spins into down and up. So that's the quantum fluctuation. So in other words, the ground state of such a Hamiltonian is no longer just the classical nail state, but has these quantum fluctuation configurations mixed into the configuration, mixed into the ground state. So that's what the magnetic problem looks like. Instead of having full order of a spin half on each side, either up or down, um, it instead has reduced magnetic order because these fluctuation terms are mixed into the ground state. Now we turn to a mapping of this problem to bosons. Here the upspin is mapped to a boson uh, that is occupied at a site. Downspin becomes uh, an empty site. And in terms of operators, SI plus, which raises a spin at a site, becomes a boson creation operator. SI minus, which lowers the spin at a site from up to down, becomes a boson destruction operator. Remember, I'm talking about spin half, so that maps into hardcore bosons. You can't have more than two bosons at a site. Okay, and SIZ, which is a combination of SI plus, SI minus, minus a half, becomes NI minus half. So clearly, when you, uh, if you have a boson at a site, NI is one, one minus half is half, so that corresponds to spin up. And if it's an empty site, Ni is zero, zero minus half is minus half, so Sizz is down. So that kind of uh, corroborates this mapping. Okay, now with an additional sublattice rotation on the B sublattice, as I explained in the last lecture, the Hamiltonian we get is a hopping term for bosons from one site to another and a nearest neighbor repulsion plus a constant. This constant is uh, nothing but the energy of the antiferromagnetic state. Now, uh, what is deceptive here, the hopping term looks like it is quadratic, but actually it's a very strongly interacting term because there is a constraint coming from the hardcore interaction between the bosons. And that shows up because bi dagger square is equal to zero. And this is coming from, once again, the fact that we have a spin half problem. You can't, you can take a down spin and make it up, but you can't raise that spin any further. So this is a very strongly interacting problem. Even if the nearest neighbor interactions were zero, uh, the first term itself, uh, would have uh, effects of strong interactions. To see how they would show up, let me now turn to a different problem where I have no interactions between bosons. So we can forget about the spin problem, just move into the boson space and look at a Hamiltonian HB0. Zero is indicating that these are non-interacting bosons. I've changed uh, J to just a generic hopping integral T, and Bi dagger Bj is now describing the hopping. Here now the Hamiltonian is indeed quadratic, 
And by going into Fourier space, this Hamiltonian can be diagonalized. And what we get is a band, epsilon k, which goes from eigenvalues from minus 2t to plus 2t, or you can put in a coordination number if you want. But essentially, epsilon k as a function of k des describes a whole band of states that are now allowed for a given lattice. If these bosons are non-interacting, then at zero temperature, all the bosons will occupy the zero momentum state. So the occupancy, nk uh, average, is just going to be a delta function at k equal to zero, and the strength of the delta function will be nb, which equals all the bosons. And this is the phenomenon of Bose-Einstein condensation. If the temperature is not zero but finite, then we know that the condensate will be depleted. The number of bosons in the zero momentum state will now be less than nb, and some of the bosons will be excited into higher momentum states due to thermal fluctuations. These uh, occupancies obey the boson occupation statistics, and if you integrate all of those states, you will get nx uh, uh, occupied states, so nx, uh, n excited, ex, plus n0 will still be equal to the total number of bosons. Okay, the question we now want to ask is, suppose we remain at zero temperature, but increase the interactions between the bosons, then what happens? So we can see uh, qualitatively that due to the interaction, some of the bosons will get scattered out of the condensate into higher momenta states. So even at zero momentum, even at zero temperature, we will get a depletion of the condensate from NB to something smaller, and the bosons which, are, which have left the condensate will appear in these higher momentum states. Um, now, this is not happening due to um, thermal fluctuations. It's happening due to the interactions between the bosons. And the question we want to ask is, can the co condensate be totally depleted? So um, that motivates looking at a more general Bose-Hubbard model, which has a hopping term between bosons. And instead of a hardcore constraint, we just put a tunable repulsion U. Essentially, if there are two bosons at a site, Ni is two, so two times one divided by two, that costs an energy U. And as the number of bosons at a site become larger, the repulsion grows. And then there's a chemical potential mu, which controls the density of bosons on a given set of lattice sites. Now, um, this model is a very interesting model. We will see that it shows a phase transition between a Bose condensed state or a superfluid state and an insulating state. And rather remarkably, all the a lot of the features come through even at the mean field level. So let's look at that because then we have analytic control or you know, at least using Mathematica, we can solve the problem very easily. So as we have done before for uh, Ising model, uh, mean field approximation is essentially a statement about uh, small fluctuations or zero fluctuations. Here, there are several ways to do the mean field theory. We will choose to do it on the Hoppick term. So recognizing that the order parameter will be bi dagger expectation value, we can look at the fluctuations of this operator with respect to the local order parameter. And when I multiply that on two sites, the fluctuation square we assume is zero. That's the mean field approximation. So this can then be expanded. And what it gives us is bi dagger bj is essentially a term like either bj or a bi dagger, these operators which multiply average uh, uh, of, these expect of these operators, which are basically the order parameters. 
and a, and a constant term, which is the third term here. So with this, you can see that the Hamiltonian uh, becomes a sum of on-site terms and looks like this. The on-site term is, has a term which is the order parameter psi multiplying ai dagger plus ai. Oh, sorry, it should have been bi dagger plus bi. I will correct that in the notes. And there should be a coordination number which I've suppressed and absorbed in t. Um, then there's a second term, which is t times the order parameter square. And that's essentially coming from the third term here in the, in the, uh, in the uh, expression for bi dagger bj. And then the on-site terms u and mu. Okay, now importantly here, uh, the order parameter in general is, um, has O2 symmetry, so it lies on, a, on the complex plane. Um, but we are going to assume that uh, the system spontaneously breaks symmetry, and so we can pick theta equal to zero as the direction in which the symmetry is broken. So all the phases lie along theta equal to zero. But we, what we will solve for is the magnitude of the order parameter. So this single site Hamiltonian, we can now write out in the occupation basis N. So either at the site, we have zero bosons, one, two, three, and so on, a tower of states that we can truncate at some maximum value. And this Hamiltonian, you should check, um, can be written out in, these, in, these, in this form. Uh, the diagonal elements have U and mu, and the T psi square term. Uh, the off diagonal elements contain the hopping minus T times psi. And you can see here terms like square root two and square root three, and that comes from the creation and annihilation operators acting on these number states. So once you have the matrix form of this Hamiltonian, you can now fix particular values of mu over T and U over T and determine the eigenvalue. So the eigenvalue uh, for is now this will be a function of this unknown parameter psi. And so you get a function of E0 as a function of psi. And essentially the order parameter for this set of uh, parameter values in the Hamiltonian will be given by that value of psi star that minimizes the ground, that minimizes the lowest energy of the Hamiltonian. So with that psi star, we also have the um, eigenfunction and we can determine the density, which is just the expectation value of bi dagger bi. And what you find is for a fixed u over t, as you vary the chemical potential, the density starts with an empty lattice, then the density starts increasing, it reaches one per site, and then it flattens and remains one for a whole range of chemical potentials. Again, it reaches another critical value of mu, then the density starts changing again, remains flat for another set of uh, mu values, and again, it has this, um, uh, it has this variation. So what you're seeing is kappa, which is uh, the compressibility, essentially equal to dn d mu, um, it is finite in these regions where the density is changing and zero in the intermediate regions where the density becomes flat. Corresponding with that, the order parameter as a function of mu over t is finite in these regions where the density is changing and becomes zero in the regions where the density takes on integer values. So what we uh, define as the, as the superfluid phase is that region where the order parameter is finite. So psi is non-zero. And you can see that also uh, indicates that these regions have, have number fluctuations, and that's why the compressibility is non-zero. Uh, and 
it has a well-defined phase, so there are no phase fluctuations. On the other hand, the moth insulating regions are those where the order parameter is zero. Um, it has a well-defined number, so there are no number fluctuations, but it has the conjugate variable, the phase, shows strong fluctuations. So we can get a phase diagram now um, in terms of the two parameters mu over t and u over t, demarcating regions where the order parameter is non-zero, that's the green region, from the regions where the order parameter is zero and density is fixed, those are the moth insulating regions. So you can see here that if I were to uh, fix the chemical potential and tune u over t, then you can see that there'll be a quantum phase transition from the superfluid fluid phase to a mod phase um, at zero temperature. Um, this same phase diagram can be shown in another way by plotting mu over u, so using u as the um, unit of energy and t over u. Um, so starting with uh, sort of the localized limit where hopping is zero, and at that point, what you have are just these mod phases with uh, different densities, one, two, three, and separated from these superfluid phases that you get as the tunneling between the bosons is enhanced. So please go over this lecture, and I think we will, uh, you have all the information now to look at the quantum phase transition in this Bose model, and we will discuss it tomorrow.